Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for High Velocity Radio. Welcome to Coach the Coach, helping business coaches deliver more impact in less time. This is Stone Payton broadcasting live on the High Velocity Radio Show and the Business Radio X Network. If you're a business coach and want to help more people make more money and own your backyard, go to mybrxstudio.com. So Lee Cantor, my partner in crime and often co-host on this series, conspicuously absent this afternoon. We've got him across town doing some on-site radio work at a co-working facility called Office Evolution, but that's okay. I drew the long straw. I get to do the cool stuff. Please join me in welcoming to the broadcast, coach, consultant, and co-founder with a Life Aligned Coaching. And I didn't ask you before we went on, is it Myrna or Myrna? It's Myrna. Welcome, Myrna King. How are you? Oh, good. Lovely to be talking with you, Stone. Well, I have been so excited about having this conversation. I know you're doing a ton of great work, and I do have some very specific questions on a couple of topics that are near and dear to my heart. But uh, first, just kind of as a little bit of context and primer, can you just tell us in general, what are you out there doing for folks? How are you serving people? Well, I'm here in Central Texas, Austin, Texas, and I work with uh, businesses and executives, uh, small business owners, as well as, you know, individuals who want some coaching support to kind of, you know, you talk about your high velocity radio coaching is a high velocity business. We sort of shorten that yield curve and help people expand, grow, change, elevate faster than they would on their own. So I help people do that. Now, maybe it would be helpful for our listeners. I know it would be helpful for me to get some common definitions around a few terms. And I think two to start with are coaching and consulting. Do you see a distinction in those two? And if so, could you share with us how you might characterize each? Yeah, Stone, that's a great question. I do both, and so I do see a distinction. Um, with consulting, which is what I did for years first, uh, you really are hired to produce a specific result using your own capabilities, your own experience, your own network, and um, you know, depending on the kind of consulting you do, program consulting, uh, training, computer development, whatever it is, they hire you to take them from point A to point B and you do all the work or your team does all the work and they pay your fee and they got the job done. So it's very specific period of time for a specific dollar amount and you bring your skill set to the table to produce the result there they've hired you to do. With coaching, it's a lot more difficult. It's another order of difficulty because my skill set is brought to bear. So the person that I'm coaching produces the result. So we start with wherever that person is and identify maybe any gaps in their training or understanding experience and then work with them so they produce their own results with them uh, walking alongside us on the path to, you know, where their destination has been outlined. So we teach them how to fish instead of putting the fish in the boat ourselves. So it's a little more work, but it's so much more rewarding too. So I do coaching and consulting, but I guess if people are looking at, do I need a coach or a consultant? A consultant will just do the work for you and deliver it on time at the price agreed upon. And with a coach, they teach you to do that. And they're not done until you're good to go and you know how to do the thing you hired the coach for. So, um, yeah, I think that's the distinction. So it might be partially due to the fact that we started doing this coaching series and we have started visiting with a lot of coaches. But it, it seems to me like there's been almost like this explosion of coaches, a whole bunch of coaches coming on the scene and it being a lot more uh, popular. Is, is there some truth to that? Is, is there more that's coaching that's, now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the business is about 25 years old, um, professional coaching. Even today, 
I still run into people who say, what do you do when I say I, I do some consulting and some consulting and some coaching and they say, what sport do you coach? So I think <laughs> there's a pretty big uh, number of people who still hear the word coach and think baseball, basketball, field hockey, <laughs> you know, they think of sports. Um, but after 25 years of opportunities to be a professional coach um, and then the growth, particularly of life coaches, I think some people understand there's other kinds of coaches out there. And you're right. There's been an explosion um, listening to the International Coaching Federation's annual report of how many new coaches there are. They've had banner years for the last couple of years, you know, 20, 30,000 people at a clip per year joining the ranks of professional coaches. So you're right. It's growing very fast. So, so how do you shop for a coach given that, and maybe someone like myself, you know, I begin particularly after, after doing this series to appreciate the, the potential value of, of a coach or coaches in my life. I don't have the first clue about how to go about shopping for a coach and what to be looking for and asking for any counsel on that front. Oh, sure. Well, there's a pretty big range um, in experience, in the cost to get the coaching done. But I think you sort of begin at the beginning, which is what is it you want to achieve? So some of them are pretty straightforward. A person who's recently divorced and wants to reenter the dating world may engage a dating coach or relationship coach. That's a pretty straight line. I'm not dating now. I want to start effectively dating that's pretty straightforward. What do you need? Oh, I need someone who has experience and a track record in helping people get back into the dating world and, and successfully date and meet interesting people. So first, what is it you're trying to get done? And then um, what kind of coach supports that activity? So I work with a lot of executives um, who are being challenged on their job in ways that are stretching them past their, uh, you know, sort of the Peter principle, kind of past their capability or past their comfort zones. And they realize to be successful in their job, to fold that new division back into their department or to grow the company 25% when they've only ever grown at 10%, they're going to need some help. Um, they need somebody in their corner who's going to help identify what are those challenges and how can I meet them since I haven't done it before. So once you know what you're trying to accomplish, that gives you a clue. And then um, I think normally people who are shopping for support professionals, they ask around and um, they uh, get referrals. You can look on LinkedIn. And then there are various coaching sites like the, you know, ICF or International Coaching Federation and have lists of coaches in your area. So get recommendations from friends. And then when you talk with coaches, um, say, this is what I want to accomplish. So you can find out right away, is it something they have a track record of doing? The last piece is just, are you simpatico? You know, do you understand what they're <laughs> saying when they're talking with you? Could you take the action that they're describing that you should take? You need to be able to get along and understand where they're leading you. So does this feel like it's a relationship that would bear fruit would be the last piece of that, I think. Well, and this may be an overgeneralization, but I'll throw it out there. My instinct is that having done this series for a little while and, and visited with probably 15 or 20 coaches by now, <clears throat> I, I get the sense that you guys are pretty collaborative. And let's say you and I had that conversation that you just described. And for whatever reason, it just didn't feel like, you know, it was the right fit. I, I, I get the sense that you would probably mm -hmm. try to help me find the right fit, right? I, I'd say that probably 40% of the people I talk to, I refer someplace else. So you're exactly right about that too. You're kind of getting the hang of this stone. I think <laughs> um, after maybe talking to 15 or 20 coaches, you're getting the feel for this. Um, yeah. About 40% of the people I talk to, I'm not the fit. And so I think what's different about why coaches are so collaborative is coaches have had an experience professionally where they've been hired to help someone and the, the help isn't um, leveraging the person in the direction they want to go or maybe at the velocity that they want to grow. So if you are trying to teach someone to fish and they're drowning, <laughs> you realize, okay, maybe I'm not the person to teach them to fish because I can't keep their head above water. So let's find someone who can teach them to swim and then teach them to fish. I'm not that person. Um, so there's quite a bit of referral because the match is really important for it to be successful and coaches hate 
not being successful with clients. It feels bad. It feels wrong. It's a, it's an L in the loser category. If you're not helping your client achieve the results they're paying for and that you're working together to achieve. So identifying that it's not a fit early on is a win actually, because you can point them in direction for other people who would be a fit and they can have a successful coaching experience. So is there, is there still a sales and marketing aspect to someone who has a coaching practice? Like I have friends, I don't know if they're, I have friends who are consultants and it seems like they have to have Mm -hmm. a sales and marketing aspect to their business. Is that, is that true for coaches as well? I think so. I think it depends on um, sort of their area of coaching. Um, that, that points them in the direction of how they might get the word out about what they do. And then, you know, the kind of coaching they do. So there are some coaches that do destination events. They charge you $10,000. They take you to Bali for a week. Um, that's one kind of marketing. Another kind of marketing is you have executives in your C-suite that are not getting along or don't play well with others. This is how I can, you know, straighten them out so that they're contributing members of your team. So depending on the area of coaching, that points you, you know, to where you might do your marketing. But I think there are a lot of networking meetings and rotary clubs and presentation opportunities as well as the normal digital online marketing. And then it sounds like, your business radio programs um, help get the word out too for coaches. I, well, I do think that it helps. That's not the direct purpose of it, but I mean, we do have like this mission at our network to support and celebrate people out there that are, that are doing good work and coaches, you know, definitely, definitely fit that bill. And we're so fortunate. We get to meet some really great people doing some, doing some marvelous work. It, I just, I just wonder yeah. though, it seems like, you know, you got this explosion. So you got all these people out there. It's, it seems like a crowded market. So I just wondered if a, you really did have to put some real attention towards sales and marketing. And then B, I don't even, even if I had expertise, <laughs> I don't know that I do. I, I don't, I mean, where, like what, how do you even figure out fee structure and how to communicate? I mean, all of that really takes a lot of thought, doesn't it? I do think that coaches, that collaborative nature, we do help each other into the business. I've certainly helped launch maybe 20 coaches in the 10 years I've been working on it here in Austin. So I do think other coaches help coaches. Um, So, and there's a ladder based on your experience and who your market is in terms of the fees that you charge and what the expectations of, you know, quality of service and the results that can be produced. So I think there's a ladder of fees. Um, but yeah, I think the marketing is definitely necessary. Mostly if people have been coaching for a year or more, they have enough success stories and they've figured out that what their groove is. I'm really good with women that are 40 to 55 and I'm really good if they're trying to start their own business or they're trying to reenter the dating pool again, or they're trying to, whatever it is, coaches sort of figure out what their personal jam is and then have success stories about that. And then finding ways to share those success stories is one of the easiest ways to do that marketing. I, I love that idea of finding their, their jam. My business partner, Lee, who is often in these involved in these conversations, um, he's a, a very big proponent of identifying a, a niche and really, um, how does he put it? Like play your music for the people that want to hear your music. He says it more eloquently than that, but he's a very big believer in sure. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds like, it, it sounds like you mm-hmm. are as, as well. So when it comes to getting coaching with and through Myrna, is, is there like the Myrna methodology? Do you subscribe to some, disciplined uh, set of steps from some other methodology or how do you go about it? No. Yeah. I guess how I go about it is a little more bespoke or a little more customized. You know, I use the symbol of the stacked rocks, you know, and call the business a life aligned because I think that people who are in alignment in their lives, you know, are happy and thriving and they usually want coaching for those parts of their life that are out of alignment. And so me personally, I ask some questions around, um, you know, where are you stuck or where do you think things, where are you feeling the friction in your life? Um, And is some of it personal and is it some of it about business or how you make your living? And uh, then look at the priorities of, 
you know, what is the biggest pain point? And if that came out of, you know, that was resolved, what would the next pain point be? So we sort of have a hierarchy of need. Um, but yeah, so where's the friction? What's not working? Then I also try to understand in terms of checking the fit, am I the coach for them? Um, what sort of things they've done, what paths they've taken to be successful with similar problems in the past. So if they've had a failed business or if they had a bad business partner or they didn't get along with their last executive team and they're also along with their current executive team, you start to kind of unearth what are those patterns that we could talk about so that this time it's different. So what have they done in the past that has been successful? What are the patterns that are reappearing? And then, you know, that sort of gives you a roadmap about, you know, what could be worked on. I think what's important about coaching is how much is the person you're coaching bringing themselves to the process? Because as I described the value of coaching, you actually have to do it. I'll show you how to bait that hook, but you got to put it in the water and then you got to watch the edge of that, <laughs> the end of that fishing pole. And when it starts to move, you have to pull the fish out of the water. So <laughs> I'm there alongside you helping you on your way, but you got to do the fishing. And so it's not a done for you just add water and then your life works out. You actually have to roll up your sleeves and be ready to do the work. Um, and some people are not ready for that. And so it's good to identify that too coaching may not be the right step right now. Now, the rationale behind that set of disciplines of where I really have to do the work, is that because that's the only way that it's sustainable? If we don't do it that way, then I have to swing back to you to get the next thing done? What, what, yeah, what's the reason for I, hearing yeah, yeah, I think. The, yeah, I think the reason is when you look at um, a challenge that uh, keeps repeating, they didn't finish the work those other times they worked on it. Mm. And so um, if you're going to do the complete work with a coach, you get all the way to the other side and then you've seen, okay, so the next time X and Y happens, this is what I do. And then I don't get the outcome I don't want. I get a different outcome, which is more what I want. Um, so yeah, to do the complete work all the way to the end so that you're actually getting different outcomes based on the new actions that you're taking, the new thinking that you're doing, the new response to these similar challenges that's different than the old response to those challenges, then your life changes. And yep, so that's why they have to roll up their sleeves and, and do the work. Uh, these words, alignment and friction, are very vivid imagery for me. Like I can really identify with those words and start to apply them. And I, I have a feeling a lot of our listeners would feel the, the same way. Have you, I know the answer to this is yes. So I'm just going to ask you to describe it more, but what I was going to ask is, <laughs> have you kind of cracked the code for a, a simple, succinct way for people to begin discovering uh, if they're out of alignment and if so, you know, how much and where kind of thing? Yeah, I think it starts with, you know, if you're just in the discovery process where you're trying to figure out what is it that needs to get done and, and should it get done with me as the coach, questions like, you know, what's waking you up at night? You know, if I asked your wife or your husband, you know, what's the top thing that causes you trouble, what would they tell me? And, you know, so, uh, well, they would tell you I'm not patient or they would tell you I never get any place on time or they would tell you I can't manage my money or, you know, other people have been telling them and um, they may not have come circled around to confronting it themselves, but this is the root of their challenge. So trying to identify those things. And then if you're engaged and you're hired as their coach, to identify the very first thing we're going to work on is this thing that's waking you up at night, and that is your money. It's your teenage child. It's your, you know, inability to manage your time. It's your whatever. And then when we've knocked that out, number two and number three look like this. It's funny, but as a coach, there's usually a thread that runs through the top three things. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even though in the describing of them from the client, they may seem like apples and pears and bananas, the coach <laughs> is thinking fruit and fruit and look, more fruit. So um, it's a little more evident. As you hear a friend describe a problem for you, it's like, well, I think I can see my way through that because it's not your problem, it's your friend's problem. As a coach, too, we have that perspective of being outside of the problem ourselves, our heart's not tangled up in the challenge that the client is facing. So our perspective is always easier 
because it's not our problem. Our own problems, well, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Clients' problems are pretty obvious. <laughs> but you must find it incredibly rewarding when you help someone work their way through something like this process and then they do kind of get realigned and because I I know it, there have been times in, in my life where everything just seemed to, to, to go like it should. And I bet it's because I had these ducks in a row, if you will. And for you to help someone work through to mm-hmm. a point, that's got to feel really good, right? It, it is really good. I hear these, these odd statements sometimes that tell me I'm doing my work properly. I hear clients say things like, you were talking to me in my head this morning and you said, <laughs> <laughs> fill in the blank. I knew if you were in that meeting, you would have told me the following. <laughs> so that means I'm actually getting through and you have realigned your thinking and you're not a victim. You're going to take charge and make your choices and live with those choices. You're not being victimized, whatever it is. So, yeah, I get feedback that, you know, six months later, a year later, I was in this meeting and I heard you in my head say, actually, you have a choice in the matter. And then I made a choice and I'm so happy you still live in my head a little bit, even though we're not working together now. <laughs> so, yeah, that's useful. Well, I'm sure coaching can be a very financially lucrative um career calling but man talk about the emotional compensation when what we're talking about right now when that happens that's that's got to be that's got to be yeah. one heck of a uh, of a high now on the other side of that uh have you found yourself or have you seen colleagues in a situation where really the best thing for everyone is they need to for lack of a better term they need to fire the client because they're not doing whatever they need to do Oh, sure. I think if you, I, I think that's kind of a, an early failure is the best kind of failure. You know, they talk today about failing fast. So I think in the first 30 days, I actually have a, a, a point where at the end of the first month of working together, we actually have to decide to continue to work together or not. Most coaches have you agree to work with them for three months or six months because that makes the cash flow even out. But for me, I want to know in that first 30 days, we've moved the needle and that this still makes sense. And that's a good exit. If we haven't moved the needle and the person hasn't done any of their work and is avoiding it or quote unquote, too busy um, at work or other things to say, you know, this is not getting you the results you need. So I'm going to back out at this point and circle back with me when you do have time, energy, interest, whatever that is. So I think a quick fail is the best opportunity to know um, because you can tell yourself um, as a client, I'm ready. You know, I've committed the dollars. It's a little bit like buying the gym membership in January. You're so <laughs> totally going to work out this year. And then February 15th, you haven't been there in three weeks. And so you committed the money, you committed the time, and you really, really wanted to, and you're not doing it. So sometimes that's the answer. And okay, so uh, the gym is not going to be your plan this year, or it'll be your plan when you've committed differently to it so that you actually go. So yeah, that happens. And um, it's actually a good thing. It informs both parties. Maybe I could have screened a little better Mm -hmm. to not sign up someone who wasn't ready. And then for the client, I guess I'm really not ready. I'm not facing that. This is going to take more work than I imagined. I'm not, not ready for this coaching thing. So that's good information on both sides. And now for your practice, have you found a way where some of it involves What's the right word? Virtual or group or asynchronous kinds of exchanges? Or is the vast majority of your work like direct face to face? Or how how have you designed your practice in that regard? Most of it is one-to-one. Um, I've done some group programs. Um, we've set up some speed coaching here in Austin. There's a, a virtual program that we're launching soon called Business Builder Bootcamp. And so that's for people who want to work through seven modules of, you know, everything they need to do to have their individual practice working um, or individual business working. And they just go week to week and commit to I'm going to work on marketing and I'm going to work on my bookkeeping and I'm going to work on my, you know, operations. So done both the virtual um, as well as the one to one. The most emotionally rewarding is, of course, the one-to-one because that's the, you really move the needle in that environment. But the other is, is good too, because you reach more people and they can dip in and dip out. So there's a little more, um, 
there's a lack of pressure about um, being part of a group because, you know, you can bring whoever you are into that meeting and get what you get out of it, circle back with follow-up materials or dial in again and listen to the recording. If you were too worried about something at work or some other project and you weren't fully present, you can circle back and become fully present. So people that have impossible schedules, sometimes virtual programs that offer those, you know, recordings that you can listen to a second time. Um, or a third time can be very helpful if you're of lots of other things that you're doing. So what I'm hearing in that is it's not, it doesn't have to be an either or it, it's a both and and there's advantages to oh yeah to, to both. And this yeah. business builder boot camp that you described, I, it sounds to me like a good constituency for that is the person who is wanting to launch a, a consulting or coaching or freelancing business this absolutely is probably, yeah. yeah okay all right so i've got that yeah one. the gig economy is enormous yeah like one in three people are participating in the gig economy working adults in in america today so yeah i think it's a an important category it gives people a way to be in charge of their own lives instead of necessarily doing the nine to five so i i, I gotta ask because the answer is yes i just i guess i really want to know more about when but the, the question is, is there a book in you, you or do you have any plans to write a book maybe <laughs> not yet um you know a couple of little ebooks on the shelf that i haven't released yet but no i do appreciate authors i promote other authors books all the time there's a great book that's out just now this year called atomic habits i don't know if you've seen it um but it's that psychological process of the small steps um and uh, this author's interpretation of that was good and engaging so i recommend books all the time so yeah i recently helped co-organize a ted talk i shared ted talks all the time too um that help people be inspired and get a different perspective on something so yeah i think that's all good all that information is good well, I'm always interested in what uh, another way I've asked that question before is what's on your nightstand. <laughs> I'm always interested in what people are reading. <laughs> and a lot of times uh, it's books. And then sometimes it's like articles or journals or blogs or or nowadays even podcasts. Mm -hmm. But I, my experience mm -hmm. has been that the people who are the life, the life learners and typically candidly, some of the more successful people in business, professional services and other uh, arenas. I mean, they, these are people who I, read, I guess read is, has, is it has an expanded de definition now, but they read, they go out there, they're thirsty, they're hungry. They, they learn is what they do. It mm -hmm. sounds like you're one of them. Yeah. They commit to lifelong learning. Yeah, yeah. They commit to lifelong learning. I think most coaches are, you know, committed in one way or another to the, class of activity called personal development and so there's always something you can be working on to improve or understand more of and you know how fast the world is changing today you no sooner get your technology nailed down than it's all obsolete and you have to re-educate yourself <laughs> on whatever it is you're doing so you know uh, the world is on fast forward right now so I think keeping up with it is important uh, before we wrap, I wonder if we could leave a certain segment of our listeners with a little bit of counsel advice from you, someone who's kind of been there, done that, maybe even has some scar tissue and you can save them a, a little heartache. And I guess it's two constituencies that that uh, that burgeoning coach, that, that young, younger person who's thinking about a, a coaching career and or that person that maybe really is fulfilling that function in some corporate chair somewhere, but is seriously considering striking out on their own, a, a piece or two of counsel, you know, like that, that, you, that now on the, on the other side of things, you're like, yeah, I definitely do that or definitely don't do this or uh, anything you might offer. Those folks would be great. Yeah, I actually think it's, this, I think it's the same advice. Um, I talk with people who say, you know, oh, you're a coach. How long you've been coaching? I've been consulting for a while or, you know, I'm a therapist and I'd like to add coaching to my practice. About half the people that became coaches last year through um, International Coaching Federation were current or former therapists. So there's a lot of people that are adding coaching components. Mm -hmm. And I think the best thing to do is to find four or five pro bono clients and offer to coach them for free in a three or four session package uh -huh. and then get a feel for 
can I move the needle for that person? So actually go do it. That's the in the doing is the learning. And so explain, I'm thinking about launching a coaching practice. Do you want to be a guinea pig for me? Or I'm in a beta mode, you know, can you be, can we do four weeks together and figure out your particular thing that you want to, you know, get coached around? Let's see if we could make that happen together. And then if at the end of the, the month or six weeks or eight weeks that you work on having four or five clients and take them through a process, did you move the needle for them? It, do you like doing it? Were they happy with their result? And then, you know, coaching is something that you should pursue or you know what? It's not. <laughs> You're not patient <laughs> enough or you don't have the language that helps motivate them into action or whatever it is. But go take on a few pro bono clients for a, a month or six weeks and see if you can move the needle. And that'll tell you go, no go. That sounds like fantastic counsel. Well, Myrna King coach consultant, co-founder with a life aligned coaching. This has been an absolutely delightful conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And Stone, I've enjoyed us. it. Yes, Thank you. this has been a blast. All right, until next time, this is Stone Payton. For our guest today, Myrna King, coach, consultant, and co-founder with a Life Aligned Coaching, and everyone here at the Business Radio X family saying we'll see you next time on Coach the Coach.